So I, I'll just reemphasize the, the grand question or the theme that, that we had here. Uh, how might the evolution of the atmosphere through Earth's history, including its interactions with the solid Earth and biosphere, inform our exploration of habitable worlds? Uh, uh, the, the main authors on this, this uh, sort of white paper uh, were Tim Lyons, Jake Bailey, myself, Dave Johnston, Chris Reinhardt, Clark Johnson, and Mark Paskowski. And there were further comments from a number of other folks at the, at the big roadmap meeting. Uh, and we've incorporated at least a few of those in, in this document. And I'll, I'll just emphasize that uh, we're really interested in starting a conversation over this. And so in addition to the, the time that you have to ask questions or make comments here, uh, we're going to be opening up the document for comments on Google Docs. And so we're really interested in, in seeing what people have to say and, and what ideas you all have to bring. OK. so. This, uh, this concept paper was, was really driven by the, the realization that, that when we speak about habitable planets, um, in particular about habitability on Earth, we, we mean different things over uh, the known history of Earth. Um, and so we, we started to talk about the term states of habitability. Uh, so Earth has evolved through many states of habitability over its last four billion years of history. And so what it, what it has meant for the Earth to sustain life and what life has been able to inhabit Earth has changed radically over time. And those different states uh, each represent a, a unique combination of processes that occur both on and uh, below the Earth's surface. And so what we're talking about here are different, uh, different couplings and feedbacks between different uh, components of the Earth system, um, obviously both the above and below the Earth's surface, and then also uh, different forcings um, external to the Earth. Now, each of those states, we, we'd argue, represents uh, a potential test case or, or a window for thinking about uh, what we what might mean for another plant to be habitable. And in particular, um, the, the atmosphere is really where a lot of these processes get, get integrated and become accessible to investigation when we're looking at other planets. So the idea here is that you know, within the next decade or so, uh, we have a chance potentially to start examining the composition of atmospheres around other planets and using those as as a window or as, as state variables into uh, thinking about what may be going on in potential biospheres or uh, different components of, of those other planets. In order to interpret what those things might mean, we need to be able to use Earth as a test case and um, evaluate what, how, the, how the atmosphere has changed over time and what that has meant for the internal state of the Earth and, and for the organisms that were inhabiting it. And there are obviously many different approaches that have been and will be used to examine how the Earth has worked as a system and how all of these things have driven changes in the atmosphere. Um, so we, we've listed a few here. They, they appear at different places in the concept paper. All these things ranging from, from uh, lots of really incredible new analytical techniques that are coming online, and, and both in terms of new availability and also just plain becoming um, more economical for use by investigators who think about these problems. Uh, new geochemical tracers that are being developed and applied to, to earlier questions, um, and just simply new questions that we're now able to ask about early environments. Uh, let's say people are, are starting to apply uh, genomic approaches to understanding uh, early evolution of life and, and starting to interface that with the, the fossil and geochemical records of life. Um, and then finally, uh, we, we see that there is always going to be a place for classical field geology um, and going out and actually looking at rocks and placing things in, in tailor environmental context. Um, but that com combined with uh, new approaches to refining 
estimates of ages and, and rates of processes will be very important for thinking about how the Earth has evolved in the system. Um, and then uh, just one final thing, we, we see that, that those kinds of studies uh, are, are now being very fruitfully combined with, with studies with both modern analogs and with, with model systems in the lab. And uh, we predict that, that those kinds of studies are going to continue to be important in these problems in the future. So now, Jake is going to, to talk a bit about some of the, the sub-questions that we identified within this overall uh, theme. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Okay, so we have a, a number of different uh, sub-questions that we identified under this theme, and I just want to kind of um, summarize uh, some of those. Um, the first one is to um, understand how habitable states on the Earth originated and how they were maintained, um, and also how they kind of transitioned into um, succeeding states of habitability. Um, and these, if, we, if we're able to do that, then we can kind of place kind of important constraints on potentially on understanding habitable states on other planets as well. And so how might we go about doing that? Well, we could potentially characterize and quantify these different diverse states that the um, Earth system has occupied over time and then look at those kind of critical processes that have governed its evolution um, and couple that with a, a modeling component uh, to better understand how um, various different state variables um, measured on other planets may reflect the kind of their evolution and uh, states of habitability on those planets. And by state variables, we mean stuff like uh, atmospheric composition or the composition of um, sediments and sedimentary rocks, or also um, the presence or absence of key metabolic processes. The second one is, uh, what are the roles of uh, tectonics and climate in shaping a habitable world? Um, and the idea here is that uh, um, hab uh, the habitability of a planet is, uh, is, could potentially be um, heavily influenced by um, the kind of tectonic system on a planet, as well as the types of um, process-based biosignatures um, on a planet. Both of these things uh, have the potential to be um, heavily influenced by um, tectonics. And so this could be uh, addressed by learning more about kind of the um, the origin and, and early evolution of plate tectonics on Earth, um, tectonics over time, and kind of the relationship between tectonics and changes in the biosphere, um, the atmosphere, and uh, the composition of the deep Earth. Um, and this could include uh, kind of quantitative models of planet evolution and also looking at kind of uh, explicit linkages between uh, models of tectonics and um, atmospheric chemistry over kind of geologic time scales. Um, what is the relationship between uh, transitions, transitions in the geosphere and transitions, uh, evolution of the biosphere? Um, so examples of this would be like, for example, the, um, the changes in, in oxygen in the Paleoproterozoic and in the Ediacaran, um, what kind of uh, uh, biosphere uh, responses accompanied um, these uh, these uh, geosphere changes. Um, and these can be basically um, addressed um, in a number of different ways, but one way that's uh, kind of um, increasingly important is kind of looking at the coupled relationship between um, different geochemi geochem geochemical proxies for um, redox states of the atmosphere and the oceans, and then trying to look at those um, and their relationships with um, kind of the, the, the stratigraphic record and also the uh, paleontological fossil record. Um, the next one is how have ecosystems been uh, structured through time and how has that affected their um, biogeochemical function? So the critical questions here kind of focus on um, the development and spread of, of new biological processes, um, the environmental uh, gradients and uh, conditions that um, develop in response to these new communities and also that influence the, the evolution of these new communities. Um, and also looking at the rates of um, uh, biological processes and uh, um, basically the exchange of materials between um, the, the biosphere and geosphere over, uh, over long time scales. Okay, 
Um, an important component of looking at kind of the, the coupling of the geosphere and biosphere um, is, is time. And so if we want to look at rates of, kind of evolutionary change and environmental change, then um, we require kind of a precise understanding of the ages of the, the samples that um, are being looked at. And so um, this sub-question kind of um, underscore the importance of, of age dating. Um, the fidelity. So what's the fidelity of proxies of, of biology and environment over kind of long, complex uh, geologic histories? Um, and the idea here is that um, the fossil record is not a complete record. The rock record is not a complete record. And it's also a record that's been um, altered over geologic time. Um, and so um, a critical aspect of, of looking at um, deep time is actually understanding um, the different factors that have kind of influenced uh, what, what record we have preserved. And so these types of investigations could include things like um, diagenesis experiments, so looking at kind of the roles of things like pressure and temperature um, on um, geochemical signatures, for example, um, or also looking at, for example, investigating uh, unconformities or times of erosion or non-deposition in a sedimentary record. And finally, um, how might studies of the ancient Earth inform our understanding of future changes um, to the Earth system? Um, and so the idea here is basically to try to um, take what we've learned in the past and try to use it to um, predict what, what future changes might occur um, in the Earth system. And so um, an example of this would be that um, perhaps a better understanding of the so-called Cretaceous uh, Ocean Anoxic events uh, might uh, help us better understand kind of the um, expansion of, of hypoxic conditions uh, in the modern ocean. So those are the kind of the sub-questions that uh, fall underneath um, this, this overall um, topic of looking at um, the evolution of the, the atmosphere over, over all of Earth's history. Um, and so we'd like your feedback on um, not just what we presented today, but really the kind of the paper that this is based on. And you can, uh, you can find that uh, paper um, on Google Docs through the Astrobiology Future uh, website, and you can make comments there. Or we can uh, start a discussion now, which would be great. And questions, if you have any questions about what we've presented today, um, we can talk also about maybe what's um, missing from um, what we've presented here, or also maybe things that are redundant or kind of not necessary. Um, and do keep in mind that this is just one of, of many, many uh, papers and many webinars that are to come. Um, and this one kind of focuses on um, the atmosphere over time, and there are lots of other um, diverse topics as well. Thank you, Jake, and thank you, Mike. Um, I, I'd love to open up the floor quickly, so if you do have any questions, uh, there's a little man with his hand up right above me. Uh, you can click that and raise your hand, and then I'll call people in the order in which they raise their hand. Um, while you think of your questions or your comments, in the meantime, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the process and what we're hoping for here. Um, there are quite a few um, white papers that are, have been released and, and more that are forthcoming. You can find them on the home page of the astrobiologyfuture.org, right down the center column. And if you click on the title, it'll tell, you, um, it'll tell you a date. That's the date that the webinar is happening. And if you click on the title, it'll take you directly to the Google Doc, um, where you can leave comments. Um, read, review um, for the authors, and uh, we really want this to be a community effort. We want people's feedback and comments along the way so that this can be a well-vetted, peer-reviewed process, uh, which will uh, lead to our, our, uh, our new roadmap. Um, I, have, uh, I have put both those links in the chat window, and um, it's actually, you know, if, if you, uh, you have uh, questions or comments throughout and you don't feel like raising your hand, you can also use the chat window. Um, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Somebody raised their hand for a second, and they, they went away. OK. Um, Marco, did we have somebody raise their hand? Yeah, it looks like they logged out. Um, first name was John. I didn't catch the last name. But if they're still on the telecon line, maybe they can chime in. John, are you still there? All right. So if any 
anybody else has any comments or thoughts, please uh, use a raise your hand function. Um, in the meantime, I'd, I'd like to review those questions. I'd like to just pull them up. Um, they're also in the notepad on the side. Have you look at them and tell us, you know, which which of these do you think is is the most urgent? Which one is a is a most interest to you? Um, perhaps to tell us if there's a question that you feel should be on this topic that isn't there. Right. Sarah, I'll, I'll just add really quick that um, we've identified some, some ways of tackling questions that uh, have been important that we think probably will be important, but we tried to remain open to new ways to, to ask these questions. So we're not, we're not trying to prescribe particular methodologies or approaches to answering questions. We're, we're really trying to focus on what we think are important to, to ask and answer. Right. And we're still open. I mean, this, that's what this process is about. We're still open to um, revising this document. And so um, your comments are, are very welcome and are critical to this process. Um, if there are aspects of, um, in particular, deep time investigations that you think um, might kind of um, address our understanding of um, the habitability or the evolution of, of the other planets, then definitely um, speak up or also uh, contact us after the webinar. Um, I think our contact information will be available as part of that Google Doc. If it, isn't, if it, if it isn't currently, but I think we'll put that information up. So in addition to commenting, if you have particular questions for us, you can contact us. Directly. I think we we have a hand up from John. Um, I think it, all it says is R U M dot dot dot. So, John. <laughs> yeah, this is John Rummel. Anyway, I just uh, wondered whether or not under the plate tectonic activity as a subset or somewhere else, uh, if there's a consideration of the effects of tidal forces on the evolution of the Earth's crust. Uh, and I say that for two reasons. One, because um, tidal forces certainly uh, affect you know, parts of the Earth's surface, but whether or not there's a crustal effect that leads into a plate tectonic world, uh, or whether or not, uh, as Peter Ward and Don Brownlee have said, a moon is required, um, it would be interesting to have that at least as a consideration in this process. Right. I think that's a great comment. Um, and I think that's something that we could potentially include under that. Um, that subtopic of looking at kind of tectonics as one driver. Well, like, it, it seems to make a big difference for Europa. <laughs> and so if I'm going right. to go ahead and wonder about this planet, and I'm going to want to let you up in the same breath, uh, I'm going to be looking for times. Yeah, I had a little bit of a hard time hearing there at the end. Um, but the point okay. is taken Yeah, no, I was just saying that the tidal forces are clearly uh, important in a place like Europa. And right. so as a more generic thing, I do think we need to keep it in mind. Right. That's a great point. Thank you very much, John. Um, we also have some comments in the chat from Sean. Um, he says, a, a key question to me is how did the interfaces between different components of the Earth system change over time? And then he elaborates. Sean, would you, would you like to say a word? He may be in a place where he can't talk, so he's he's continuing to type. It looks like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a bummer. <laughs> um. and, and as a follow-up to uh, to the tidal forces comment, uh, <coughs> you'll also probably find that there's some other uh, headings on other papers where that would be an appropriate comment as well. I'm not I'm not saying it isn't here, but you should probably bring that up. Uh, in several places and make sure it gets to interact with, with some other ideas. Um, Sean's comment is, includes a, um, a discussion of the subsurface biosphere that's often parameterized in atmospheric models. And I think uh, that's a, um, a really good point and something to um, consider is how how is the um, deep biosphere actually recorded in the ancient rock record? I think that's um, an area that's uh, still sort of underexplored and um, could potentially be uh, important. Uh, 
I was trying to type here, but couldn't figure out how how to get it at the moment. But Sean, I'd be really interested in hearing a little bit more about what you mean by interfaces, and and maybe an example of how those might have evolved. It looks like we're slowly getting a typed out response from Sean. So while we wait, I urge those uh, on, online to, to review the questions, to think about how they might contribute in this conversation, because the richer we make it, uh, the more valuable the end product will be. And I, I know you may not have had time to review the white paper ahead of this, uh, this webinar, um, but your thoughts even at this stage are very welcome. Also, because this is an ongoing process and we'll be doing this for a while, um, I'd really love your feedback on uh, how the process is working for you and how, how it's engaging you and how we might make it better for you. So um, I see we do have a response from Sean. He says, how, for example, how different planet sizes, interior heating rates and sources, et cetera, translate into volcanic outgassing rates and compositions. And so specifically right. on the Earth, we might be talking about how these things have changed in response to different interior heating rates. Right. I don't recall exactly what um, section it is. I think it might be the tectonics sub-question of the paper that kind of looks at um, the changing uh, kind of composition of the deep Earth over time and then um, trying to... Um, apply looking at the, our understanding of the deep Earth, our own planet's um, deep Earth evolution, and trying to apply that to um, other types of planets. Um, I think that that is a really important question, and I think at least some of that's in there, apparently. Thanks, Sean. If there's ways that you have. Um, would suggest that we um, add to that particular section. We're definitely I'm excited to hear them. So, we have Lindsay slowly typing into the chat, um, uh, and she uh, says that there's a white paper: how extensive, diverse, and robust are surface and deep biospheres, and how do they function? So, there's a there's obviously a a place for, for that comment, but it also exists here. So there's a lot of overlap between the topics, which I think is, is only um, valuable. It's not, it's, not, it's not a bad thing. And we should bring those things up as many times as we feel they, they should come up. Right. And a lot of the investigations of the deep biosphere focus on a modern biosphere or um, a biosphere that's a modern extant biosphere that's present in ancient sediments and not so much on um, the actual record of an ancient subsurface biosphere. And so that's potentially a place where um, this topic and that topic could um, interface or inform one another. Excellent. Um, are there any other thoughts or questions from the, uh, from the community? Comments? Jake, Mike, is there anything in particular that you're very curious to, to hear from the, the audience, from people who are going to be watching this now or recorded? Is there anything in specific that you'd like to know from them? Well, I, I'd be particularly interested, in, you know, especially if there are any biologists in the, in the group here, about uh, essentially what, what aspects of how organisms organize in the ecosystems we we may want to address that aren't in this document already. Um, you know, that's, that's something that I think people are starting to think about. We certainly tried to stay, take a stab at it in this group. Um, but I think that, that part is potentially something that could be even better developed by interfacing with a few more biologists. So are there any biologists out there listening right now uh, who, who would like to raise their hand and chime in? 
And, uh, and are there any biologists who are watching this and recording and perhaps want to leave a comment on the Google Doc and, and reach out to Mike? Jake, are you particularly curious about anything? Well, I guess one thing I would kind of mention to the group here is that uh, there's a particular, you know, kind of um, discipline um, focus to our group, our kind of working group here that's, you know, focused a lot on geochemistry and um, paleobiology. Um, but there are other potential um, sub-disciplines of um, life sciences and earth sciences that could also um, that probably aren't very well represented in our group, like for example, paleomagnetism. So, or or looking at, for example, the the role of uh, magnetic field evolution of uh, Earth's magnetic field or other plants' magnetic field over time. I don't think that that's something that we we covered, for instance, and maybe we should. So, um, certainly, if there are uh, people from kind of um, subdisciplines outside of just uh, kind of paleobiology and geochemistry. And we definitely want to hear from, from you as well. And maybe just uh, one last comment, or this is really the comment. Um, something that I think is maybe a little bit unusual about this white paper, and uh, maybe it hasn't quite struck people yet, is that uh, we, we want to be fairly emphatic that, that there is more to be learned from Earth history than just focusing on the Precambrian. But, a lot of these states of habitability are um, in some ways even better understood once you get up into the Phanerozoic and, and they're, they're worth continuing to study and learn more about and, and thinking about how plants evolve and how that might inform how we look for uh, other biospheres. And so um, you know, I just wanted to get that out there and if that, if that also sparks some thoughts, I, I hope it does, uh, please send us some comments. Right, and just to follow up on that, another thing that we were kind of interested in is not just looking at kind of the um, the exciting periods of, of change in Earth's history, but also looking at kind of the the long periods of stability and like what allows those to occur. Those are something that's often not really focused on. You know, the the boring billion or you know boring parts of what's thought of as being boring parts of Earth's history might be really important and be telling us important things. Um, but they're not often not as sexy or whatever. And so um, that's something that we kind of try to address a little bit um, in this white paper as well. And even ask if those, are, if those times of apparent stability really were stable or simply just long-term slow transitions into something else. Right. Thank you very much, John, and I appreciate your time today. And I want to ask the audience before we go, um, we, we're going to be doing quite a few of these online discussions uh, as ways to kind of launch the white papers and collect feedback and share share the, uh, the current state of thought with the community. And um, we, we'd love to have your feedback on this. How, how is this discussion for you, and how can we, what would you like to see in future discussions? Um, if there's if there's anybody who can raise their hand and tell us what they particularly liked about this experience that we should replicate in future ones and and what they uh, they were expecting and maybe didn't get that we should try to incorporate into the future ones that would actually be very useful. You can type into the chat or you can raise your hand and, and we'll call on you to uh, to speak through the phone whatever is better for you. Um, we'll give a, a minute to participants to see if uh, if we have any feedback on our process. Well, um, if, uh, if you do have any thoughts about that, please uh, communicate them to us through the, through the website. Um, you can reach out to any of the KI No Innovation staff. Um, we are there on the website, or you could also reach out to, uh, to anybody from the NASA team. They'd be happy to, to incorporate your feedback as we move forward. Uh, gentlemen, any closing thoughts? Well, we look forward to your comments on the Google Doc on the, on the paper. Um, so if you haven't read it, please, please do, and we really Look forward to reading what you had to say. And, and feel free to contact us. Uh, we're eager to talk about these things. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and thank you very much to our audience for uh, for your attention today. Have a have a great afternoon, and uh, we hope to see you at the next one of these, which is tomorrow. Thanks. Bye bye.